Welcome to this week's Beers and Bites episode, co-hosted by Chris Jordan of Fluency and Jeremy Murdashaw of Fortify 24 by 7. Our very, very special guest today is Sarah Jane Turp, otherwise known as SJ Honley. And uh, we are very, very happy to have her on board. And there's going to be a lot of questions that we're going to have for her because we're going to talk all about disinformation and all all this data scientist stuff and things of that, that it's going to be very, very fascinating to go over. So with that, uh, Chris, why don't you start us off with what you are drinking tonight? Thanks, buddy. I've been waiting for this. So I, got, I was able to sneak out a couple of weeks ago. I got a ghost fleet from a Vanished Brewery out there in Leesburg. And then uh, I stopped by the Costco on the way back and picked up some angry, angry Alice. So uh, just from Rocket Frog, in case, in case you know the backup. So I got two regular uh, New England pale ale and a, a second uh, double IPA. So we're doing good today. All right. If we hit a third beer, we're in trouble then tonight. Well, I'll, I just have to walk out all day. <laughs> all right. We're all falling over. Uh, Jeremy, what'd you bring this evening? Well, in uh, celebration of the Dodgers being in the playoffs, I've got the uh, Wow the Dodgers uh, blonde ale here. It's a tall boy. Made by uh, Golden Road, which is a local LA brewing company. And just in case, I got an American Blonde by uh, by Luke, Lucky Luke, uh, Luke's original American Blonde, which is also very go. delicious. And SJ, I know that you uh, have no gluten-free beer at the moment, but so what did you bring to the table this evening? Uh, just a twenty volt. Uh, there you go. Nice. And then for myself, I've got my old standby with the. Texas, uh, <laughs> Ducky Port, uh, what is it, Hoppy Duck IPA. So uh, hopefully we'll make it through that by the time that the show concludes. All right. So with that, uh, cheers. Cheers. SJ, thank you. And SJ, if you could talk a little bit about yourself so that the uh, listeners know who you are and what you do, uh, other than the fact that you are a road queen, right? That you're constantly traveling. Uh, but please. Well, I'm not traveling so much this year, but normally I'm on the move a lot. Um, I I guess I'm a data scientist um, because I've always been about the data, but it's about the data that's about people. So I care a lot about data that affects human beings. And I've been working on data sets since the 1980s, <laughs> I started uh, originally working um, on signal processing, hunting for submarines, adding in human reports into uh, large scale um, sonar and other sensor images. So what used to be data fusion became information fusion. We tried calling it knowledge fusion on top of that, this idea that you were combining different people's points of view. And we talked about um, how you could combine partial viewpoints of the world and how you could start spotting people injecting what then wasn't even called disinformation. It was like we were talking about um, counters. We were talking about um, counterintelligence. But now I guess you'd, you'd call misinformation in, into information feeds coming in. So it was just all part of the big games. Um, so years of that, years of working on unmanned systems. So working on the underwater robotics programs, working on drone safety programs and running innovations labs on aerospace uh, and drones and ending up by accident <laughs> by a, um, just happening to be in the right place when they needed the right type of person running um, that data response around the world for disasters. So ending up running crisis mapping teams around the world and then over at the UN, which is how I ended up in the US. And then from there on to disinformation, um, various forms of various, various parts um, from European research projects back in the early 2010s through to looking at how I could help back in 2016 
uh, through to just now concentrating on it this year, this past year, this past two, three years. It's, it's been, seems like forever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the, my whole life has been aiming towards this election. <laughs> I was talking earlier about how 10 years have passed in the blink of an eye. So you, you get 10 years well, in every sure. month right now. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> So you, so you are engaged in, in some of the, uh, uh, I'll say, disinformation or information going on uh, from the political environment today? Uh, the political disinformation is part of it. Um, a lot of what we've seen up until recently this year has been more financially motivated. So you've seen a lot of grifting, a lot of people who've seen an opportunity to make money. Uh, even when you're digging into stuff that's politically motivated to start with, there's usually somebody pushing it along because it can sell their T-shirts, their books, their uh, clicks and eyeballs. So it, it's a mix. Uh, there's also people doing it for attention, which on top of the... Politically, so it's it's a bit of a mess out there. Has been. It's the last few weeks. It's it's been a lot of political because that's you know, where the attention is. Sure, sure, sure. But we're seeing this mix of political. Plus the other thing to watch right now is it is extremism. To to watch that starting to come through. So. Yeah, intent is only one part of it. And so what is the, so you founded the, uh, was it the Cognitive Security Collaborative when? Oh, okay, so the Cogset Collab started in January this year, so 2020. But before that, we ran two groups called MissInfoSec. So one group was a standards group where we adapted information security standards to for use in um, misinformation, disinformation tracking. And another group was a group where we just found people who were working in the field and put them all in the same place and got talking to each other. Um, so we just wanted people to produce work um, and get the word out really to the places that would need to deal with what's become quite a large flood of misinformation now. Um, I'm using the words misinformation and disinformation. Um, there is a difference. Uh, for a long time, we used the word misinformation to cover everything because just people weren't ready for us to talk about the differences. But generally, disinformation, um, there's a stronger intent. There, there is usually... Uh, a team, an individual pushing the falsehoods, uh, and the falsehoods aren't necessarily in the content. So you can have a disinformation campaign with completely true content. Um, some of the black focused stuff has been with completely true information, but very um, falsely amplified uh, with fake uh, accounts. So you're, you're thinking it's coming from groups and places uh, and emotions that aren't there, but it's using real content or it's using real content that's out of context or that's old and we amplified again. So I, I'm probably gonna say misinformation and disinformation, but I think I recall, generally we, we're tracking disinformation. I, I recall watching a, a mm. television documentary where I believe it was the CIA caught when of Russia trying to gather intelligence on our space shuttle and that they had found that there was a leak or they'd broken in somehow and they were getting that data and that the CIA managed to tweak that data. They didn't change a lot of it, but they changed it enough so that when they built whatever it was that they built, that it ended up being a big failure and they never really pursued it further beyond that. Mm -hmm. Right, cost them millions and millions of dollars and time and effort. Um, so I, I suspect there's a lot of that going on with intellectual property out there today. Uh, that you know, when nation states and, and other you know nefarious actors are breaking in trying to steal that, that they may have honeypots, if you will, right, of 
disinformation. Oh yeah, honeypots, data poisoning. I mean, the stuff that you do in machine learning infosec, so MLSEC uh, and adversarial learning works with humans too. I mean, it's none of this is that new. I, I mean, misinformation, disinformation is as old as humans, is as old as human communication. People have lied. People lie to each other as part of being human and getting along. Um, people lie in for advantage for lots of different reasons. We, we shouldn't be surprised that, that scales. That's true too. So, so it's also a heck think? of a lot cheaper than rockets, you know. It's, <laughs> <laughs> so one thing you're doing is you're putting a framework on it, right? So, so yeah. we have minor attack and yours is 18. Amit. Is it Amit? Amit. Yeah, okay, Amit. I don't want to, like, when I think, I think of like a meet your end, but no, no, Amit. I mean, <laughs> I'm a, okay. So, um, so that's a really interesting approach, right? Because right now, like even in this conversation, right, trying to follow it and develop a framework by which people can have a conversation becomes incredibly difficult, right? Like you said, hey, you have disinformation on one side, misinformation on the other. I can it came from land information warfare activity. I mean, we had our own way of talking right, in, in the mm -hmm. basement with field manual 100-6, right? So the way information has changed in the military obviously has just gone leaps and bounds. But when we go over and we take a look at it from a commercial sector, right? Now you're in an interesting position, right? Because uh, you're, you're looking at it not just as a government issue, but just as an overall structure, right? I mean, that's the yeah. main objective. And, and yeah, so I mean, how, yeah. It, it's about having a common language. Um, one of the first problems we had to deal with was that, well, two, two problems. One, one was that people were looking at misinformation when we first started and they were pointing at misinformation. They weren't actually describing it as a incidence, as components, as the way that we were used to breaking down what was happening and if you can break down what's happening, you can talk about how to, do, to address it. If you've got component-wise breakdowns, you can talk about component-wise counters. You can talk about uh, reuse. You can, you can with the, all the things you do with attack. Yeah, but yeah. also, we had a language problem. Uh, campaign means a different thing to the marketing people we're talking to. It means yeah, a different was, thing to the military, means a different thing to the commercial. <laughs> We, and we I was going to ask you about that because you yeah. used the word campaign, and mm -hmm. to me, we have we have tactical theater and strategic mm -hmm. level campaigns. Yeah. And so, when when you start developing this, do you, do you wind up breaking your terminology based upon uh, the scope of the campaign, or or, or is everything always a global scope? I mean, how? No. I mean, this um, must have been like a lot of drinking and, and sticky notes. Um, oh yeah. So. Uh, we, we had a reputation for using all the sticky notes in a building. We, we literally <laughs> ran, uh, I think it was the Carter Center. We used every okay. single sticky note in the building, <laughs> which I'm, I'm still quite proud of. <laughs> but um, we, as far as possible, we stuck to InfoSec and Mechatra, uh because when we looked around at the scale of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had lots of different teams who were likely, who were in existence, you were likely to get that scaling up with um, things like marketing agencies going rogue, because this is basically dark marketing. Um, so you were likely to get this going like spam as being right. like a, a widespread um, generated problem. So you needed a widespread response. And the only community that had the scale already in place was the InfoSec community. Mm -hmm. So we had to write in a way that the InfoSec community would understand, which is why we've spoken so much at InfoSec conferences. We, we targeted them, mm -hmm. deliberately targeted them above everybody else. Are you finding and, and the adoption rate is, is, is moving strongly or, or is it a real slow effort uh, trying to get people to adopt? Uh, well, weirdly, the kind of um, other people have come in. So now you've got um, disinformation people keynoting at Black Hat and 
it's it's gone from us being the first people in. It's like I believe I was the first person to give a misinformation talk at Black Hat like two, three years ago now. Uh, to now it's unusual to have an infosec conference without uh, disinformation streams. Are you get your own village in DEF CON? Um, AI your... village. Um, so yeah. AI village is machine learning infosec. Okay. But we had, because I was, I was on the board, uh, yeah. we had a little bit of an outbreak of misinformation there, and it's never quite gone away. Um, yeah. Despite every so often trying to pat it down and go, look, guys, this isn't actually what we're about. <laughs> is, that, is that like misinformation against the AI people? You're going to take over their village? No, <laughs> never, wanted, never wanted to take over the AI village. Um, okay. We talked about running a misinformation village. Uh, but it was too early when we talked about doing it. Uh, it just would have stretched too many people too thin. And I think there was a good compromise there. There was a misinformation exercise at Roots, which was mm -hmm. a really interesting, um, interesting first pass at a build a botnet, um, try breaking this exercise that a bunch of Congress critics came and saw. Uh, there were talks from people like Van Wartsman, who is excellent in this field. Uh, I mean, I, I come on the backs of great men already, great people already. Um, he's one of them. Uh, well worth listening to, reading. And that it is, the two shouldn't be conflated. Um, although Things like adversarial learning, although things like deep fakes mm -hmm. overlap strongly with disinformation, they're not the same thing. And, mm -hmm. and it's like it's it's a mistake to think they're the same thing. So, so let's take a step back. So 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 you brought up the monetization and in my brain brain, I, I thought weaponization would have would have been the first concept. But obviously you're saying that monetization really moves uh, the misinformation world. Now, that's obviously from the, I hate to say it, from the negative side, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we're not going to get around and start creating misinformation for, for, for good. I don't know how we do it. But the, the next question would be, you know, obviously, security has commercialized itself. Do you see, how is the commercialization from a defensive perspective? Okay, uh, so we, we, how do you see that path going? So we've been trying to build an industry or at mm -hmm. least to trigger an industry. And we were seeing one forming, um, but we're seeing one forming as a layer, a top layer. So you've got um, like the standard Stanford, Stanford Graphic or DFR lab, you dub a, a part of a group, you see other clusters, uh, there's a Harvard cluster, there's like a Cagni Mellon cluster, that, Again, academic, some companies. So FireEye, Lee Foster over at FireEye has been quietly doing this work for okay. quite a long time now, doing good work on how you do the tracking, how you do reporting. But to have an industry, you need to connect people, which is why we built the MISP networks. Mm -hmm. uh, you need ways for people to get into the grid. Um, so we see this being a combination of disinformation socks. So we just wrote about that the other day. Um, so there's like the Cognitive Security ISAO is likely to be a disinformation sock. There's likely to be a few large disinformation socks, um, either coming out of some of those labs, but also within some of the platforms because they have this problem continuously. Uh, and they're really finding their cojones right now. Um, they're really go going for it on cleaning up. Um, and having disinformation desks as part of existing SOCs. So you're likely to see this turning up in some of the other large companies. So not necessarily so platforms so like the Microsofts, like the, um, oh God, the registrars. So, so, so why would, but well, why would Microsoft do it? Let's say Microsoft created a misinformation sock and they implemented it. No. What would be the the benefit to the end customer and the benefit to the 
into the company financially? Uh, I don't think, I mean, I think they would probably, they might go for a stock, but they're more likely to put desks or a couple of desks onto an existing stock. Um, so the benefit is in reduction of risk to their customers. So you have things like brand risk, reputation risks right now. Mm -hmm. um, you have the risk to the platforms, the organizations themselves, that they are part of an attack. So Microsoft are parts of botnets. They, they've taken some of that down recently. Um, other companies are parts of attack services. So this is why you need this joined up, um, like the ISAL network idea of connect them together so that people can do the piece that's relevant to them and watch for the piece that's relevant to them. Um, smaller places uh, are likely to be doing things like specific brand um, management. So you're, I've already seen a couple of uh, marketing agencies adding disinformation to disinformation protection to their portfolios. Yeah. But you're likely right. to see, um, we're, we're seeing some hybrid attacks. So one of the ones we've been watching for is ransomware plus disinformation. Uh, at the moment, ransomware is on its own a decent market, so they, they don't need to add anything else. But mm. as it goes underground, company, huh? <laughs> well, as it goes as it goes more underground, they're going to need okay. to up the ante, and this is one way you can up the ante. To increase the value of, of the compromised box. Uh, you increase the pressure on the decision yeah. makers. You increase the pressure on the decision makers via their secondary and their decision makers. And yet, didn't so, the U.S. government just come out and say, we really don't want you to pay ransom? It kind of almost... Um, well, that's actually the forcing function. That U.S. government decision is likely to force this to become a thing. Um, up till then, it was like, yeah, this is a market. It's a stable market. Um, so if that goes unstable, this becomes part of... Uh, disinformation becomes part of other attack surfaces. So there becomes a market there for smaller players. So Accenture so, talks about in their, their ninth annual cost mm -hmm. of cybercrime study, the fact that with ransomware, right, it was initially, hey, I'm, I'm going to lock up your files. Mm -hmm. Here's the key for the money. You know, give me the money. Here's the key. And then we all saw that big uh, case where a legal firm was breached, right? And they refused to pay, and then they started putting public information out yeah. about their high-profile clients. Now, Accenture is saying that the next front of that is, in fact, taking the data integrity. So going in and mm -hmm. manipulating that data. Yeah. So now that you're questioning the integrity of the data, period. And yeah, I don't definitely. know if there's a way to recover from that. Well, that's one of the things you've got to protect against. I mean, that, this is something that Danny Rogers um, spoke about a few years back now, um, was that there was a CIA, so confidentiality, integrity, availability equivalent mm -hmm. for human information, and that misinformation was basically an integrity attack. Mm -hmm. So it's nice that they caught up. Um, so, so do the security models work well with the misinformation? So I'll, I'll give you another security model because yeah. we're up the CIA. The other would be uh, opportunity, threat, and vulnerability, right? You have to have those three in order to have an attack, yeah. right? So does that type of model also extend itself into the misinformation? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, pretty much every infosec model we've thrown at it works. works too well, it just huh? works in different ways. We, we, we looked at a huge stack of models before we came up with Amit. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked across the InfoSec models, all the different types of InfoSec models. We looked at some existing disinfo models. We looked at marketing models, so sales funnel models. Sales funnels are great for radicalization. Uh, they describe the process nicely. Um, there, there were a couple of others. We, we just kind of went hunting for something that might match. And mm -hmm. we ended up with a stage model just because it worked for working out what was happening. I mean, working out the defenses. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think it's exciting because you look at security and you, you brought up the fact that 
you know people are doing with their, their reputation and their image, right? And if you remember like DEF CON like six and seven, and you had attrition.org and you had uh, Jericho getting up there and you had all the people talking about uh, reputation, that most of the attacks at that time were reputation because people didn't know how to monetize it as well as they do today. Now, obviously the universe has completely changed and pivoted since those days, but now you're, I want to say you're, you're, you seem to be on the ground floor of, of almost like a, a new industry and as it yeah. evolves, and that's the reason why I asked you how you see it changing. It's like, it's like, it's almost like we were just reading the first chapter of uh, Cryptonomicon and, 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 and we're getting ready to, to find out what's going to happen next, right? And, oh, I mean, and, you, know, you read the cuckoo's egg where we, we, you can track oh, through the cuckoo's egg. And basically, I about once a year, I say we're at this point in the cuckoo's egg. Yeah. So, you know, we're at you're, the point. You're putting the printers all together. and. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're towards the end of the cuckoo's egg now. Excellent. Excellent. It's good to know that. Part. But it is, it, and, and what is Cuckoo's Egg, though? That's like, I want to say it's like 91 at the end of that one, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Pongo and those guys, yeah. So people so are talking about look, defenses now. I mean, literally, last November, we held a, a workshop on how to defend because nobody was really thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. So, so it is, and that's, I think it's an excellent beginning, right? Because defense requires some type of action. And, and, and the reason why I was asking about the commercialization was that I think Al began going in that direction is brand imaging would be probably on the top of my list as a company if somebody was misinformation. I would go back, right back to the person you just early said, you call one called dark marketing. I would have given this to my marketing team saying, fix this. I don't know if I'd go to my security guy saying, fix this. And that's kind of an interesting issue because marketing people don't think in the same tactics. You as, can't. Right? Yeah, you can't do it just with a marketing team. You're gonna need right. your marketing, your legal, your, your, your security, but you need the mindset of the security people. Yeah. With the skills of the marketing people and the legal people thrown together. It's why we threw together cross-functional teams. I mean, it's just like we, we found people from all sorts of places to come work yeah. with us. That makes sense. So are you seeing any one uh, industry or a couple of industries that are the highest profile for this type of uh, attack with the uh, disinformation? That are going to be attacked? Um, I, I would look <laughs> at who's being hit by ransomware um, because they'll probably be first. That, that's just personal opinion. Hmm. Um, there, well, there may be, high, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there may be company yeah. on company attacks. So they've always already been like a telecoms company hit another telecoms company. Yeah, so you, sure. you can take out, um, you know, by threat for money, or you can take down reputation. So you can do things like tank stocks. I mean, that's that's a really old maneuver. Yeah. Just they read old books. Um, you can take out reputation of principles. So you can do a misinformation attack on the um, C-suite, part of the C-suite. Um, you could do an attack across the personnel. Um, it could be short or long, and it depends, you know. You could do a very fast one, maybe deep fakes and voice, uh, or you could do something at slower burn. That, a lot of this already, already happens. I mean, it's the social engineering. It's just like joining it up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine that you know corporate espionage has been going on forever, mm. um, and I imagine that if if there was this attack against one company and they could manipulate their their intellectual property data sets, right, so that the at the end of the day they really couldn't deliver what they thought they could deliver because they didn't have the integrity of the data to work from anymore. Well, what you're attacking is beliefs. So you're not necessarily attacking the data sets, you're attacking people's beliefs in the credibility of those things. Okay. Or in the credibility of the people for whatever reason. So you don't even need to get at the data. You're just attacking your belief in it or people's beliefs in it or population beliefs in it. Did you ever read the, the sequel to Redney? William Gibson's book, what was it, The Fall or something? Was that the, what was the sequel? Do you remember that, Jeremy? Oh, yeah, and, and I skim, I skim read that a, thing. <laughs> there's, a fake, there's a fake nuclear attack in, uh, mm -hmm. in um, Moab, Utah, and they, they used the, 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 basically what the whole concept was, and it's 
you're kind of hinting at it in, in a minor way, but in there, the, the, the plot is, of course, that it's about misinformation. They, there was no nuclear attack, and the, yet they, they, they took advantage of social media. And the reason they did this was not to fake a nuclear attack or scare anybody. The whole concept was to undermine trust in news. And yeah. by doing that, not only did you undermine the news, you undermined social media, and therefore you, you, you blew away any hierarchy of, of centralized knowledge, right? It's, it's a pretty deep thing, and then the book just goes off the deep end. I've, I've got to get through the second half of it. But the first beginning of it is fascinating because what you're talking about, because you, 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 you change from misinformation, you brought up a very important word to me, which is you know trust or credibility. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, this, I'm a big privacy person, but but, you know, and accountability is a good word for me. But but trust and accountability and credibility are incredibly hard to hard values to generate. And, and obviously, in this type of environment, difficult to keep. Um, I mean, what do you see? Hard, hard to recover from, too. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, exactly. you spend a lot of money to generate credibility. And then you, you, you get lies and half truths out there, and, and people live in their bubbles today. And, and that, that misinformation, I mean, you know, listen, I, I don't want to go back to the 70s because my mom's cooking was terrible back then. But the, the, the reality was you at least had a centralized news feed, you know, that people kind of read the same script. But now it's crazy, right? And so you go back to the credibility. Or is it becoming, and th th this goes back to your, you as a data scientist, that's it. Think about where you were 30, 40 years ago, and big data before was 10 megs. I remember having a 10 meg drive on my, mm -hmm. my Avalisa, and, and that was as big as, bigger than computers are today. And, um, and now, look at information has blossomed. Social structures are much more complicated. Information structures are much more complicated. And it's all built upon trust, right? So now you have this element of misinformation coming up. Not to say that you meant to write a blueprint for it, but I'm sure if I read the, not the emit the or whatever, <laughs> if I read it, right, and, and I get hardcore, it, it would give me some pretty good ideas about how to attack that infrastructure, not necessarily define the attacks themselves. So. Again, I, I go back to this in my head. Listen, I, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I, I love business. And I really think that business people help solve problems. They don't create them, right? So obviously, there's a business opportunity here, right? Credibility. Let's just call it normality. I don't care what normality there is. Just something I wake up in the morning and believe it's the same, right? So how do we get to that point? I mean, are there actions besides more marketing money? Um, I mean, what are the things we do to help protect the individual and the company? I like to protect the individual, but I, I'll start with the company. I mean, what are, what are the actions people can do? Yeah, I mean, you, you've actually brought the thing about attack the system. So that's something people forget about. I mean, when we, we're running MLSEC, so, so CAMLIS is one of the MLSEC conferences we run every year. It's not this year because you know, COVID. Um, but we have the machine learning to defend, machine learning to attack, and machine learning to attack the system itself. So a lot of um, what's happening right, right now is the system itself is being attacked. The system of democracy is being attacked. Not necessarily this side or that side, but the whole system. Yeah. And one of the things that we have, um, so one thing is that we're all living in this twin world of we're in... The, the meat space world, but we're also in this virtual world. And you know, we're geeks. We've been in the virtual world for like a decade more. We're kind of used to this, but a lot of people haven't. And they haven't dealt with that dichotomy yet of they're not the same place. And that just because you see a person and they appear and they're consistent, they're not necessarily real. Um, we're kind of used to that. We grew up with that. I mean, that was like a given back in the old days. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of people, they've come onto the internet and they expect it to be the same as meat space. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole bunch of cultural expectations there. Um, Do you think the next generation 
you know, kids are going to be more immune to it because they're growing Oh, they're up. cynical as for naughty, so they're wonderful. I <laughs> absolutely adore Generation Z. But um, the question was what to do about it. And one of the things yeah. is that this is a twin system. So disinformation is part of an information ecosystem. Right. And you can't just go in and rip out the disinformation because what you'll leave is gaps in the information ecosystem. It, it, they're voids, data voids. And disinformation loves a void. You know, there, there's um, pink slime networks, which are news networks being set up in places where local news has just died. You know, it's, it's not been funded, it's, it's died away. So there are these fake sites gone in for your local town. And they're hard to spot unless you know about the networks. Yeah. So part of this is in making a healthier information ecosystem. So making, you know, putting money into local news, um, making sure that you have a variety of different news sources available. I mean, one of the reasons I drove all over America last year was I was listening to the radio. So as I was driving, I was tuning from station to station, looking for local radio stations. And I found very, very little outside yeah, you know, cities. Uh, it's so, like iHeartRadio owns every radio station in America almost, right? Uh, but, there's a map. Yeah. Sinclair owns an awful lot of stations. But what's, so what's, got, what's, 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 you yeah, know, big syndicates. What's, what's going through my head is, is like, you should go back to your village. You're with the AI people, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of hometown locals, along with, believe it or not, stock reports are actually generated by AI. And yeah. the reason is, is it's boring as crap. And the AI can write it just as quickly. And so, and they're finding there's, there's, there's companies out there that are generating AI news. And it's good news. Don't get me wrong. It's, mm -hmm. it's really, it's news. It's, it's enough to keep you interested to finish the paragraph to understand what happened. But you can and, fake generate it just as well then. Yeah, that's what I was going through my head. Yeah, was, it, reminded me, exactly. it reminded me of that, um, the, uh, the fake uh, MIT paper that was generated by AI and was yeah. accepted by a Spect you know, Spectrum magazine or whatever. Mm. It, it, made, it passed the peer review. And yeah. this was AI generated. And it was all crap, right? Yeah. And, 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 and so the point is, is that... <clears throat> It looks the, good. It's you, confident. You know, I mean, it's it's hard to tell some of this GPT stuff now. So it's, it's it's kind of well sorted, but right. Well, and if you create a model that validates it, the attacker can use that validation model and the AI to evaluate it before it's released to say, "Am I mm -hmm. passing a threshold?" But so when we're is, talking about content now, so we're talking yeah. about misinformation. We're talking about content based. So one of the ways that you can help there is look at the contexts. So when I said the peak side networks, it's like you looked at the, the other sites are connected to this one. So you, you mm -hmm. talked about Gen Z, but I'm, I'm very curious. I once upon a time had a Facebook account, but got so frustrated because I couldn't believe that the peers in my group and then the kind of the next you know level down, everybody was lazy. They'd read a headline and they wouldn't challenge it. They wouldn't understand, is it reasonable for this headline to even exist and then we put on here with me now lazy or tired <laughs> i mean you can't necessarily expect everybody to be a journalist that but that's either, also part of the problem people have you know once upon a time you would challenge things but people just mm -hmm. accept it as norm and it makes me worried that all this disinformation is becoming so normal that nobody's just going to check it anymore yes yeah, I agree with you. You're saying well, that your Gen Z's might be skeptical enough. I remember growing up, I mean, I challenged teachers, right? I mean, that we were taught to challenge teachers, right? Yeah. Now in the in the, the in the world of everybody has to get a 1600 SAT and and everybody deserves an A, it's more about focused on the grade and not focused on generating the character to challenge what they're being taught. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm hoping that what we're, it's on the job training to learn how to see misinformation. This is how civilizations die. You know, you put everyone in boxes. I and mean, if you right. want an example of a country that's really got its act together, it's Taiwan. Really? They, yeah. They actually, as, as a country, they have the hacker spirit, which yeah. is really beautiful. 
Now, now, why do you say that? I mean, it's just, besides they having a hacker spirit. I mean, what are the, what do you think? Not to put you on the spot, but but what were the what do you say? Oh my God, these people are getting it. This is these are the things they're doing. This is the way they're approaching well, it. This is how they beat it. Well, listen, the, the PRC is infamous for this is how we misinformation. The yeah, but but isn't 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 their goal to take over Taiwan? Yes. Or they have they claim it, that they own sorry. Taiwan they in some to way. Take over Taiwan. They already own Taiwan. They just have to remind Taiwan their own. That's that's the correct. So there, it's, it's a it's a constant battle between the two countries, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. It is. But 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 through the politics from it, because this is I don't want really to go into the politics. But what I'm fascinated by is that statement, right? Because because. I do believe culture plays a huge role in, in, in how people deal with information. And so from a cultural point of view and what the government's done and what the people have done, and, uh, SJ, what do, you, what, do you, what do you, I mean, how do you see so, the strength? Well, the strength of Taiwan is it's got a bunch of infosec people running the country. I mean, Audrey Zhang, um, their, oh, what's she, the digital minister? She has done a lot of work under the Government Zero program on you can report disinformation, you can get responses back. Um, it's so they're, totally, organizing. they're organizing uh, to leverage the trust of the government, yeah. the credibility of the government, so the government yeah. can approve this, but we're not going to tamper with it. So there has to yeah. be some trust that there's no yes. tamper. You, you yeah, know? I mean, it, I, I think the difference there is that the government is actively trying to work against disinformation, that they're actively... Um, part of the solution. No, no, you can swig some more Tani. Next question is, do you think we'd ever get that here? Do you think people would ever, oh my God, trust the government? I thought, I thought in the 1970s it was the opposite, right? I mean, I mean, well, what is, is that? that our only trust no one. <laughs> I know. I think yeah. it depends on the structure of the government. I mean, there are some very good people in the government still. Uh, a lot of people have left over the last few years. It has been rough for them, but there are still good people there. There's still people trying very hard to counter disinformation coming from other other large countries. And but so swinging away from politics, it seems mm, to me that thank you. One of one of the, uh, the earliest examples of disinformation with mass media is I go back to H.P. Wells and the War of the Worlds, mm -hmm. where I think, you know, that, that was a, that, that's a great example. You're going to talk about the radio play or the book? Yeah, yeah, where it demonstrated, right, that, you know. Well, it had the perfect situation. They had trust in the source, mm -hmm. right? The radio yep. station was their trust. I mean, if you drew a model out, it, it, it was a perfect mistake, Yeah. right? Yeah, but, 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 you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting is, is that was a mistake, right? But, but you also had the hack on CNN. Uh, was it CNN that got hacked and took took down the stock stock market because they put out a a tweet about Obama? So again, it's a trusted source, puts out something that's credible. Yeah. Has SJ, are you going to tell me that DefCon really happened and that it was a misinformation right. attack? That <laughs> DefCon was not canceled? <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, you missed some great parties. <laughs> so let's let's pivot the conversation a minute. <laughs> wait, wait, wait! Before you pivot, before you pivot, I, there was one key that was I think it was important, and that was emotion. So, so, so the people that generate the content, forget the the people today living it. That, that's not important. The people who cruise the content have emotions, mm -hmm. and those emotions impact the data. And I'll give a good example on the opposite side of the coin: is the CDC came back and had this this blob about how it was proved that COVID was a racial disease when all three reports explicitly stated, if you read the reports they referred to, that they could not make that conclusion because the sample size was too small, which any data scientist completely gets. When you have a small data size, you can't be conclusive. But then the CDC takes the three inconclusive papers and says it's conclusive, right? That's emotional, right? That's not scientific, you know? And, and, and I think that, we say the word science all the time. Like the second I say science, I must be right because I'm saying science, but but it's not right. the 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 reality is is that there's so much emotion on the summary aspect sometimes from reporters from anybody, and to manipulate the emotions of those people that produce it is is, is another 
subject to the attack. But that's and really the most effective way of the attack, isn't it, uh, to play on yeah. the emotion? But yeah, that's what's yeah, being used right now, in groups, out groups, and emotions. But there's actually a secondary part to, uh, interesting part to what you just said, which is science. Hmm. I mean, if you look at things like the structure of scientific revolution, science is all about being wrong and knowing <laughs> that you're probably wrong, <laughs> but you're making a model that's good enough for the moment until someone comes up with a better model. It, it, it's, yeah. it's a great, you know, and they say it all the time, right? It's a, it's never a fact. It's always a theory, yeah. right? I mean, we, 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 we realize, in fact, you know, to get extremely geekish, uh, Quinn and I, this morning, Al, we were talking about this, that, that turning proved, right? It started with Godel, but turning proved that there is never a complete answer, you know, the halting problem, mm -hmm. right? And information systems is no different than the halting problem. It's guaranteed that there's misinformation. It's guaranteed. Just yeah. like the halting problem is guaranteed that there'll be a failure. You just don't know when. So, yeah, I, right? I, you know, I look at the, and Jeremy, I apologize. Sorry, Jeremy, you, you had a thought. <laughs> but I promise I'll be quiet to the next question next. But as we look at- I'll just drink my beer. The, the big, was it the Hayden, Hayden Collider, right, right now? They're talking about when they made that God particle that they thought it was gonna be the end of the world people with the disinformation. And now they're out there saying that, wait a minute, we think that we're gonna be able to prove in very short order with some new tests, right? That there are in fact multiple parallel universes and we'll do that by generating little mini black holes. So the DC universe is correct and the Marvel is incorrect, <laughs> right? The flash in the multiverse is the correct image but, it, you know, you, you get into this string science, theory, right? And then the people on their emotions get scared saying, oh, my God, you know, the sky is falling. And that, I think, starts part of that disinformation out there. Uh, so, Jeremy, you were going to pivot. Yeah, did you remember? I, you got it. I do. I, 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 have a, I have a good buffer going. I, I'm curious, SJ, as, really as to your, you're part of the CTI League. Um. We had Ohad on uh, early on in the genesis of Beers and Bites to kind of talk about what the league was doing well in advance of any of the reporting that's been done. Curious to know how your disinformation channel within the league is going. Um, what kind of, do you have any statistics through the whole COVID experience in the healthcare sector that you want to share with our, our, our audience? Well, it's pretty quiet at the moment because everybody is um, cojones out on the election right now. So we have to quiet. It, yeah, but, you know, fall of civilization versus the other fall so of civilization. How is it going? Yeah, be, be, be before the election crap is, <laughs> it is what it is. What, what, how is it going before, right? Let's, let's look at that. I mean, how, how yeah. is it absorbed by the league? I feel like it's like the the super friends. How was it yeah. absorbed by the league? Did they accept it? I mean, what was kind of oh, they, they totally accepted it. I mean, it's like uh, I think we were probably the first disinfo sock. We just didn't know we were. Um, yeah. So we did things like we built tier one, tier two without tier two without realizing we did it. <laughs> it's like, so and, so and we so looked back. Go to Wikipedia and, and to, they call themselves that beforehand. Yeah, and it's like, uh, whoops, did we do that? <laughs> yeah, I think so, it's, listen, I think it's a great, it's a great yeah. story. I mean, you, are you going to speak about that in the conference? Which conference? I don't know. Any? Oh, some That's conference. Fine. Yeah, probably. A, a uh, I mean, I mean out on the B side. There, there's, we, we were doing a lot of training. We, we were bringing a lot of people through. Um, I, I think once the current, uh, oh, my God, nobody sleeps till the election happens is over, then back to, to doing a lot of that again. Because you know what? I, hate to, I hate to say this thing about the election. Scaling. Yet again, but yeah. The election's not going to change anything. People are people. That's, that's one person in the universe. It's, and, and the rest of the universe can, can move forward if they want to. It's not the election. It's the things happening around the election that are right. interest. Right. And I think, but I'm just saying, it's just so, to me, it's so, it's, it's like the stock market. The stock market is going to do what it's going to do, right? Statistically speaking, it will come back to wherever it's going to be six months to wherever it's going to be. And that it, it fluctuates based upon emotion, right? Mm -hmm. And that the question is, is that the, I guess to me, I'm, I'm a person that 
ignores the the immediate. You know, there's three universes, right? That we do. I, even though we're here in the now, I, I really think that what's going to happen is kind of like there's so much momentum. It's going to happen, right? And that, and I, I really feel that like what you're doing right now is actually really cool. I, I think it's it's such a base of coolness. But the, the thing to me is 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 how do you see? And I go back to that roadmap in my brain because I really do think that there's a future for what you're doing, right? And you must think there's a future. Or you want to be doing it. Right? Or are you so mm-hmm. busy trying to? Run I, I think I'm too, I'm too busy, to just like on, on all the firefights, that I'm just not <laughs> thinking not that really much right now. It's like, yeah, there's a okay. lot of data hiding in my head right now. It's sure. Um, so let, let me swing the pendulum a little bit. Uh, yeah, please do. It's kind of a way from this. So, SK, if you look back over your career and, and you, you talked about a fondness for being able to help people, right? And, yeah. some of the social activities that you've done across the world. What are some of your most fond memories of how you've been able to use your, your knowledge and insights around data to help people? Oh my God. I mean, some of my favorites have been the absolute, oh my God, will this ever work or not? So standing up in the middle of an all the UN agencies conference, Somebody was giving a talk. I was there to give, give a talk on the work we were doing. And somebody was giving a talk. And at the beginning of their talk, they said, we really want to do this, but we can't get the data. And I put my hand up and said, by the end of your talk, we'll have the data for you. And got on my laptop, pinged whoever was awake in my network and said, guys, we need to get this data set. I know we can do this because it was the crisis mappers. Mm -hmm. And at the end of their talk, hand back up and said, I've got your data set here. Complete bloody Hail Mary, but we needed to prove that um, community data response was valid to all the other people in the room. That was... I imagine that was a game changer. Yeah. There, There were moments like that that are just, shit, did we really do that? But also... I'm so glad we did. That would have been a little bit scary to raise your hand and say, I can do that for you. <laughs> well, I knew we could do it. I mean, I had a couple of people in Australia got on it. I, I knew I knew we could, we could get that data set. It was just a matter of if there was anyone else awake. Right. <laughs> so. Has the UN adopted the Amit, the AMIT uh, framework or, or are um, you still lobbying for that? I'm talking to part of the UN about uh, Socks at the moment. So we have teams in NATO, the European Union, and some other countries have started adopting already. So that's, nice. yeah. There's, oh, there's that's fantastic. And, and is that is that coming out of CogSec Collab or is that coming out of another entity? No, and, and, just, and is there, how do you monetize your efforts? <laughs> how, 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 how do you get paid? <laughs> That's. <laughs> I, I I mean I I think one of the reasons that we're not very much loved is we don't get paid. <laughs> um, the we made we gave we made that devil's bargain a, a few years back. We knew that we would need sharing standards. We knew that we would need a lot of people aware ahead of time in lots of different places, and. We just went, sod it, we're not going to get paid for this. If we wait to get funding, if we wait to get paid, it'll be too late. Mm-hmm. So it, it was just like, fuck it. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it's it's monetizable, yes, uh, in the same way that uh, the attack framework is monetizable. And it's monetizable as consultancy, it's monetizable as those industries that are going to form. You know, those small companies that are going to do protection work, the parts of the grids. So they, the, maybe if you are, walk, yeah, have, have you talked with any of the, oh, sorry, have you, have you talked with any of like the, uh, the, the social media management organizations or the, like, like Zero Fox or any of those types of organizations and, and had them look at adapt, adopting your framework as part of their, Product offering? We have handed it over to MITRE. So okay. MITRE, 
is but they're doing the <laughs> yeah, so yeah, but, it's a big nonprofit. But are they um, are they in process of sanctioning that publicly then, or they are themselves hunting for funding? Okay, because <laughs> it's always yeah, the way. Yeah. This, this, this but, miter as a thing, Al. Unfortunately, miter is listen. I, miters can be a fairly good place, right? Yeah. But miter's job is to to come up with the idea to to stabilize it and then to pass it off to someone else to do it, right? That's where they created miter tech. Um, but, but, you know, it's, again, I, I keep on, I, but I'm in the same boat, monetization. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to make you rich, Ms. Jay. I, 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 that's my objective in life is to make people rich. So, so one of the things- Start with me. I'm waiting. I, I gave up on you. I gave up on you. Listen, I got my grade eight little statue right there, there and you got a Vegas hat. That's, that's, the, that's the divide right there, baby. So, All right. So right here, right here. Yeah, I see that. I see got one though. We got one. So um, he's, he he can really rub my my face. Anyways, so when you start SJ, and you're starting with with a company, mm -hmm. I always say that you know this guy Ivory Wolf, he's James Boyd, good hacker, and um, he also you all had a speech called Ghetto Hacking, where he basically would show you you know you can't take something that's insecure. And then add security to it, right? And they'd have all these bizarro pictures. And so the point is, is that nine times out of ten, I think I wouldn't even say nine times out of ten, one hundred percent of the time, when you get involved with any project, you weren't there when it began. So you weren't there to plan how would you structure to protect against mixed misinformation from the very, very beginning. You're not lucky enough to sit there and say. We're forming this group. We're going to do X and just pick anything in the universe. We're going to start a nonprofit to stop human trafficking. And we're going to start this nonprofit. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to hire SJ because I know there's going to be disinformation on this. And the first thing we're going to need to do is set up a campaign, a can an anti-campaign, if you want to call it, to prepare us to how we want to deal with that. I mean, is 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 do you think? That an organization could do that? Do you think that you could could stand that up and they could they could help you work with? I hate to say the marketing company, but yeah, but, I mean, there, there, but wrong. there are lots of different possibilities. I mean, I'm working a few hours a week with a small consult consultancy at the moment, um, so looking at how to take this to some of the bigger orgs, mm -hmm. um, looking at how we can take this into other countries, um, talking to other, other places. I mean, it's, I, I've never done this to get rich. Um, we had at the beginning of this year, um, VC funding, um, VC funding with, uh, angel funding. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was angel funding to do a small part of what was needed to be done. And we weren't seeing other people doing the other pieces that were needed. So, it was a hard decision. It's like, you know, do we build a company doing a thing that will probably monetize, probably become bigger, but we don't do the other pieces that we need? Or yeah. do we just back off and do the thing that we have to do? And a lot of damn it for being yeah. idealists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what did you do that for? A lot, a lot of respect. <laughs> I, I have, in my lifetime, turned down millions. I call me an idiot. But it's always been about the people. You know, Amen. it's always been about there are people out there that need these things, that need these so, skills. You know, as, as we're getting closer and closer to doing an hour and running out of beer eventually, mm -hmm. I, I can run down the hall. Is is really you you I appreciate it. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been at DEF CON. I must have been drinking during your speech. I don't know. But <laughs> but 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 obviously you're not alone in this. You brought up other names. If maybe we can hammer you for some other names, and and, and get get a big understanding of how how big is this community? What's where's this community go? What what is a way that people just like the CIT started because people contributed, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, you know I don't. You you might not trust who knows in the government. I just sometimes don't trust the government. I would rather have a group of people get together who want to just fix this, right? That said, you know what? 
I'd rather people have the truth and let them make up their own mind. They don't have, I don't have to convince them what their mind is, right? My biggest concern is, is that they don't have the truth, right? It's and not so even how about the truth. I mean, like I said, you can do disinformation with truth. Well, the truth, but, but if you only give one side of the truth, it's not really information, right? But the, 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 I guess where I'm going is, is, is I was just wondering, what would be your recommendation? You said, Chris, when you sober up one day, where, 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 what conference should I be going to? Who should I be listening to? How can people get involved? Uh, well, CTI Disinfo, when we get back to it. Um, okay. <laughs> there are some good courses online at the moment. Um, I would Reality teams? Um, the reality team. The reality team are active right now. Definitely join yep. them. Um, the keep an eye on the Coxet Collab um, because we'll kind of point point you at what's out there. Um, Action think, hackers. Pardon? Attention Hacks and hackers. Hacks and hackers. Um, so hacks hackers is journalism and. Um, Data, data nerds, data journalists organization. Um, the Credibility Coalition, which is the standards body, um, places. So, MisinfoCon's coming up. Um, that's one place. I keep on thinking pretty much any bad. big InfoSec place now is going to have an InfoOp stream. So, check that. People, um, I really rate um, the Theos group. So Cindy Otis is excellent. Um, Kate Starbird has done some good work at UW. Uh, Lee Foster's team over at FireEye are good. So I would track each of those. Um, F-Secure, is, um, you've got Andy Patel. Um, people, uh, Conspirator Nortino. Um, and F Society, so Elliot, um, I'm trying to remember Elliot's, sorry, excuse me, I had a look up Elliot. <laughs> Edit that piece out, Jeremy. <laughs> we'll dub it over. Elliot, I room. am so sorry about this. I just, I'm, I'm just going to say that I'm not so. You, you, gave um, those, you gave 100 more names than I could do, considering I would uh, see pictures of people's faces, and I'd be like, uh, Mr. Brown shoes. El Elliot Alderson. Um, so Elliot Alderson is excellent as a tracker. Uh, yeah. Dave Troy does some really interesting work. Um, and there, there, there's there's a community. Um, Grug. Yeah. Uh, Grug is part of this. People like Herb Lynn have been here forever. Yeah, you, uh, you, don't you, get you, as much attention as they really should. Kind of interesting you said what we called one guy a tracker. So are yeah. there roles in this whole thing? Is this like a football team? Not like European football team boards and we're talking guards, blockers, you know, line. It's more, it's more like quidditch. It, it's, quidditch. It's, it's like it's like InfoSec. Um you get specializations. So you get people who are really good at data science, you get people who are really good at the Ozent site, uh, you get people who are really good at the journalism site. So people like Ben Decker. Ben Decker does the uh, Ozint behind a lot of the New York Times stories. Mm. He's worth following. Um, the data scientists, so people like Elliot are uh, data science nerds and Cospirator and, um, and my brain is going because I've drunk port. But um, then you get the people. Some more, Tani. Here's some more, Tani. We'll come back to you. <laughs> but there, there, there is a whole bunch. I mean, I, I put a bunch into the, the guide to. Um, so we wrote a book. And part of the book is here are the people you want to go look at. Is it on um, Amazon? Your no, book? not yet. Um, so we have the big book, which is our basically our working manual. Um, oh, that's a great name, the big book. Oh, big book of disinformation <laughs> response. <laughs> I, I have two yep. laptops here. I'm looking at the um, <laughs> the wrong one, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we actually accidentally wrote four books. You know, it's just I, like the, we 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 we're not known for doing things by halves. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Pablo and I are writing a book for No Starch as well, so that's um, more theoretical. 
So SJ, uh, oh, yeah, I know Starch again. I know that dude. Uh, not I, Pollock. What's the guy's Bill, name? Bill. Bill Pollock. Bill, Bill Pollock. It was Pollock. Okay, yeah. yeah. He's a nice guy. He's you're talking about a DevCon star. He is probably the the star of the vendor area. He's the my, nicest person in the vendor area you're ever going to meet. He's a great guy. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, but that is a nice guy, Alan. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, SJ, as we look to the future, mm -hmm. uh, in let's say 20 years from now, if you were to leave a video message today for the Gen Z age group about this whole environment, what would that message be? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, we screwed up. Um, <laughs> so glad you fixed it for us. <laughs> Can I have my pension, please? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they've oh got my hands full. Uh, we, we're leaving them a planet with a rampant disinfo, which hopefully is getting out of control now. I think in the next couple of years, it'll be down to spam levels. Um, but it's going to be a little bumpy for a while. The, the climate change stuff is enormous for them. They've got a lot to deal with there, both in the physical responses, but also perception response to deal with. Mm -hmm. So their, their world is going to be very different from ours. I'm, I'm hoping that they, as a generation, will have an era of cooperation because it, the problems are just too big to just totally ignore or yeah. for rich people to get in the lifeboat stroke bunkers and... Let the yeah. rest of us burn. Well, I take that back to what Chris said earlier with, with the one word accountability. And, you know, as I look to the message to the Gen Z, in fact, one of my family members just had a brand new baby girl, right? So I, I think about her future as opposed to my kids who were born like in 1980, right? So as we look at her and that Gen Z, I hope the message is we're learning about accountability outside of the political spectrum. And we're learning how to break through the garbage of bad data. I'll just leave it at that or disinformation. And we hope by the time that you are young adults, we will have set a model in place or a plan in place to help make Earth a better place. I mean, so one thing I've been thinking about for a long time, SJ, is, is it'd be nice to have a news source that was credible. I don't think there's a credible news source in the, in the world right now, to tell you the truth. I, I go through, I have them, I go through each one as a tab, and I go through each one, and then I kind of average it in my head to try to figure out what the truth is. Um, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with emotion. I really think that it's not that these people intended to give me the wrong news. It's that their emotion, they really wanted me to understand what they thought was important at the time. Is there down here somewhere, a little book from the 1980s on news. And there's a whole chapter on the fact that all news is biased. It is. Because mm -hmm. because, because, you, I mean, yeah. there's commercials that literally pay for my news, and, and Pepsi's going to cancel it if they don't like what I say. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Little book called What's News? By the way, um, you have... I, the I, media I, I, in American society. <laughs> and, yeah, I know you're a book person. I, I did read your book. You're a book person. That's awesome. Books are it, very. It, it has to. It has to. But there is just like this. Um... <laughs> what do you think? Do you think? Do you think if a news company could ever truly give me the driest, stupidest news because it's too dry, and people will go to it because they know it'll be the dry fact, or do you think they people go to news that makes them feel comfortable because they agree with it? There is no such thing as objective news. There is always editorial. You can try to be as objective as you can, but any act of news is an act of framing. It is. And that act of framing includes your cultural frame. But I know that we have AI routines that go through literature and correct gender issues. Mm -hmm. right? And so why can't we have AI that goes through, through it and correct opinion issues. In other words, I'll give you a really good example. A lot of writers at CNN will say President Trump. They'll just say Trump. Yet they'll call yeah. Obama a president. 
And yeah. so it, it would be nice if an AI just goes through and say, oh, the guy's being a douchebag again, put president there, right? Yeah, Top. that would help. That yeah, would definitely so, help. So, so there we go. There's a, there's a section the, called the selection of reality. Oh, it didn't say, I, I thought you were going to show me it said douchebag <laughs> no, no. in the news, but okay. No, no, no. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think like a technology like blockchain and the authentication of data could serve a, a purpose in, in bringing credibility back to the news? Wow. I think blockchain Why, what, is a provenance more? solution that tells you where something has been, a trail of the hands it's passed through. It isn't the same as viewpoint and what we're really talking about is viewpoint but can so it's you, useful for things blockchain. like where does this image come from and did it get mm -hmm. altered on the way yeah but the, that's right it's, it's not a bad idea so with blockchain yeah. you do wind up having an attribute of news you didn't have before which is the history of this generation and now if you go back to modeling and you say oh i can model that i can take a who, who cares put a seasonal algorithm dropping on top of how that news came to be. And I can say that news came to be in a way too short to be accurate enough. Or that news came through two, you know, sources that are all from the same opinion. Right? I mean, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to bring up because from a blockchain perspective, is when we like when you I, I, I do actually read. I read I've read one of your blogs and you talk about like reading the links and shit like that. And so so, so that's a great point. Like blockchain could do that double check that people are, as Al points out, too lazy to do, right? I mean, it's it's an interesting thing, though. Though I don't think you're going to make money on this currently, but I. <laughs> it's but okay. I, I, I only own one blockchain company. No, it's okay. We got to figure out how. That is an interesting concept. Get money. <laughs> but, yeah, but it's, 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 it's securing the provenance of the data, right? In, ensuring the. The trustworthiness of the source, right? That's, and if a reporter that's puts their puts their story into the blockchain, and then it gets picked up and it gets used or attributed, and then we become it's kind of like the concept of upvoting, right? We upvote the con the the credibility of this this news reporter, um, and we begin to tr we establish a trust factor to their to their information. And that just reminds me of politicians, right? And they're plagiarizing and people calling them out on that, right? That's, uh, but, but see, that makes no difference between who the person is and whether they plagiarize. It was a freaking good idea. But that's... Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is NATO rating. So you rate the source and the, the content separately. It's always a double rating. Yeah. But here you're rating the source content and the channels. So it's, it's, a, it's a triple rate. I, I just think, you know, we, I was originally... In this whole beginning of the conversation you were talking, you know, I did think, hey, you know what? There is a commercial capability of this. This commercial is important to me because when there's money behind it, the, 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 the people that work to, yeah, it, it lasts longer. I mean, you take a look at what the meat Iran did with Nessus, not a meat, but Ron Gula really did it. He switched it to be mm -hmm. commercial and said, hey, listen, I'm tired of doing the community because the community people didn't do anything, right? The paid people did it all. And so, and it's almost the same thing. It's like you might take a look at your books one day and go back and realize, oh, I know I opened it up to the community and the community was wonderful. But the people who are paid by companies and the people who are paid, you know, by grants did most of the work. And that really paid yeah. money is not that bad. Oh, they're and catching up with us. I mean, the paid people are, are coming through. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But I just, I, I, when I first started talking, I was thinking marketing, but now I'm beginning to see what 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 Bozo had over here with his Vegas hat is seeing, which is that that you know the accuracy of data through technology like blockchain or other technologies could actually, even if it's not perfect, could at least give a little bit more credibility, a little bit more trust. I mean, it's it's it, this is a you're not as dumb as I think you are every day, Jeremy. Interesting concept. So listen, we, we're, we need to start winding down. I know, I know, I know. I'm in my rambling mode because <laughs> this rocket project here at the end. Somebody's had you know, a third time. beer. Chris has had his quota, right? So we're, we're good now. So I'm going to close my book. You know, with Donna, I write all these notes for myself and I could just freaking replay the tape.
<laughs> so, so listen, SJ, uh, I, I sincerely want to thank you. I think that uh, and it is sincerely heartfelt because I too believe in people, right? And I think that we as a community in the world, right, should start caring more about people than self or, or politics or big business, right? And make people first. And I think if, if we ever get to that point, you know, who knows, maybe it's the generation beyond Gen Z, right? Maybe it's uh, just wishful thinking, but I, I hope that this message that we've been talking about tonight gets out broadly and widely, and that people start recognizing that it really is important that we keep this a part of our daily life and learn how to challenge, learn how to question, right, again, like we used to do years ago, and, and not really uh, give up and say, oh, that's interesting. Okay, let me share that. People, we need to stop being sheeple. So, uh, Jeremy, any any closing thoughts? I just thank you, SJ. It's been a fantastic conversation, and I look forward to uh, uh, you coming back and and having more conversations like this with us as you progress down your your path. I, I think we easily talk for hours on this. Uh, very much so. Uh, Chris, oh, yeah. any final thoughts? Yeah, I think. Listen, I I find this a, a fascinating. So, SJ, you're it, one day if people maintain a good documentation of all this, this is groundbreaking at the time. You're doing wonderful work. You know, I think it's it's frustrating that you're you're spending so much time spinning plates and not seeing all the things that are going on. Uh, I think you know I have a lot of hope in humanity, and I, I think that. The groups like the CIT League, which Jeremy introduced me to, great people, great people. And, and I'm, I'm pumped. I actually am very, very positive of, of all things going on because somebody cares. Uh, and thank you for caring. I really, I don't know if any of you ever said that to you, but thank you. <laughs>